Well, yeah, I'm very well, thank you. I'm actually in Auckland. Ah, all right. Are you there for but pleasure? It's, um, uh, look, I actually made the really wise decision to shift up back up here. I was living in Dunedin, but I shifted mm-hmm. back up here about a year and a half, just in time for the big lockdown up here. Right. So that was great. <laughs> so I, I shifted to Auckland, spent a fortune in rent to sit around in this flat for months <laughs> on end. Um, so I got full value out of my rent. Yes. And... Um, but, uh, you know, Salonius Monk, that's actually a different version to the one, um, he recorded that tune, Heats. Right. Uh, it's called Don't Blame Me. It's a 20s show tune. He did so many versions of that. But my favourite was another is another one. Oh. Where he, um, it's from a uh, collection called The Columbia Years. And uh-huh. It's a live performance from Mexico. And uh, the thing is, that dude, he never played the song the same way twice. Oh. So all the, um, all the versions are sort of wildly varying, but... Um, yeah, that version, so the version you're playing there, I haven't actually heard that before, but I guess it's still got the, um, you know, the uh, melodic discolorations that um, yeah. Thelonious Monk was famous for, and you know, I love that guy, he's one of my favourite musicians. It's interesting because he, he takes no prisoners, like he, he, he hits those keys, doesn't he? And he, he once said that the piano ain't got no wrong notes, which I love. <laughs> He got, well, as you can hear on that, he, his whole thing was playing, like I say, if you're talking about discolorations of, of melodies, he played sort of the sour notes and he was very, really, he didn't really play the the, the chords in the correct way, so the, the, it's just always a bit off. And I remember one pianist telling me that he didn't like um, Thelonious because he played out of tune, and I guess that's the other way of looking at it. But, um, you know, that's, to me, what made him really interesting as a, as a player and a musician and why I related to him too, because... The way I play guitar is kind of similar. I, I actually really like the in-between notes as opposed to the correct, um, the, the, the correct ones. You know, to me sure. they're more interesting and more mysterious. Here, well, that's that's true, and it's it's worked for you. When did you first cotton on to this guy, Thelonious? When did you first become um, a fan? Yeah, it was actually when I, I actually when I did my first Dimmer album. I did it for Sony for Sony Music, and um, they had the entire Thelonious Monk catalogue sitting in their vaults and you know occasionally they'd say I'll go grab some records so I just basically bought I just basically grabbed the entire Thelonious Monk back catalogue and then as I want to do I'd sort of go off on these little nerd um, obsessive trips with the music and um, I had a year where I just listened to pretty much nothing but Thelonious Monk and um, you know I, I, I just that's how I sort of operate with my fandom I just sort of get obsessed with things and I think we've got the Sleaford Mods coming up later on yes uh, I've listened pretty much to Sleaford Mods for the last five years I went through a really big classical music trip where I got into classical music and that's what I listened to for um, several years um, see that surprised so me like, you know when, when you sent this list I mean I think it's fantastic because you you went on that bent for a while I uh, was the classical music yeah yeah um, oh yeah, well look, I, as a, you know, I've, I've been a musician most of my, you know, since I was a kid, and um, you know, one thing you learn is that, uh, you know, look, when I was a child, I thought, well, there's nothing but punk rock, you know, and every other music was wasn't valid and was stupid and a waste of time, but. Uh, you know, you realise that there's good music everywhere and every genre, whether it's opera or hip hop or whatever, or electronica or pop. You know, the cream of the the cream on top is always going to be really great. You know, mm-hmm. every genre, the top ten percent's good, mm. and you know, the other ninety percent's generally mediocre, in my experience. But you know, the good stuff is the good stuff. Um, it exists everywhere. So, yeah, it's classical. You know, it's um, I think um, if you come from a rock thing. It's hard to find an end to classical because it sort of seems like Mount Everest mm. and sort of insurmountable and um, uh, you don't really know where to start. But, um, yeah, I got into it and, yeah, I love it. I love, you know, Beethoven, people like that. You can't argue with someone like that, you know. No, totally. Like, um, you know, I, I agree with you. Like, sometimes I just, because I know I, I love classical myself but I might you know I, I couldn't you know say oh I want to you know I won't know the titles like I won't know it's symphony in D minor or whatever it is you know so sometimes I'll just google uh, Schubert or whatever and just and just then you discover oh that's the one I love but it's called XYZ and so it can feel sure. unattainable and it can feel a little intimidating if you're not an expert on it because there are so many experts on it but it's good to just dabble isn't it and investigate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I also think it was, you know, um, uh, you know, for a long time I thought you need, you know, sort of there's a snobbery about it, and or something. There was this kind of elitist thing about it, but 
once it gets in, recce, you know, and sort of the academic, you know, you need sort of um, a degree to understand it. But look, it's just music, and music is music. It's vibrations created by human beings, and uh, you know, I love the fact that I can lock into a vibration created by a human being 250 years ago and feel exactly what that person was trying to express. You know, that's the beauty of art. And that's the beauty of music, reaching out across the ages. But <laughs> true, it's though. true. You know, yeah, yeah, that's right. And huh? you know, like you, well, you know, you should listen to something really famous like Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. That's mm. still an incredibly beautiful piece of music. You know, mm. and if you've got a, a human bone in your body, you know, you're going to feel that. Mm, I think um, so. Yeah, like that. It's, it's all music, you know. Yeah. So quite a big, so yeah. quite a big inspiration for you. This next person is interesting. The German baritone, and I, I, I'll just call him DFD because he has an interesting name. Apparently, the hipsters call him that. Actually, can you say the name for us, please? <laughs> Dietrich. Uh, well, look, I'll probably get it wrong. Dietrich Fischer Diesco. Yeah, let's go yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he he was a real famous German singer. He did everything. Uh, he did all the Schubert stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, what song? Oh, we've got old Night and Dreams. That's the one we've, we've selected. Yeah. Yes. Are you yeah. going to play that next? Yes, we are. So I just wanted to ask you oh. what, why this was important to you. I love Schubert songwriting. And uh, he wrote, he died when he was 31, and he wrote nine symphonies, countless change of pieces. Uh, pe pieces. He also wrote 600 um, leader songs, which are um, German art songs. <laughs> where he took po poems of the day and set them to music. He wrote 600 of those, and that's just, inc you know, <laughs> the productivity is incredible. Yeah. And he was also an amazing songwriter. And um, so I can, you know, when I listen to the construction of his tunes, the uh, amazing pieces of songwriting, he does a lot of moving between minor and major chords, which is sort of this emotional shift uh -huh. between moods. Right. And um, if, you, if you listen to the construction, this tune... It's called uh, the English translation is Night and Dreams. It's just this heavenly melody, and um, um, it's just a beautiful tune. I love it, and it's spooky as well. You know, yeah, great piece of music. Sounds right up your alley, Shane. So, okay, so yes. this is Shane Carter's second choice, uh, and it's Dietrich Fischer. Dis, uh, we call him Disco. Yeah, well, we call him DFS. Oh, yeah. oh, no, DFD. 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 The German yeah. baritone. Check it out. Sorry, what was that? I see what you mean. It's it is just incredible. Oh, it's so beautiful. You can you can see the full moon on the shimmering water there, my friend. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, that's um. He Schubert was an amazing melodicist. His melodies were, were really great. And um, yeah, that's just a beautiful piece of songwriting. Oh, isn't Masterly. it? Masterly. Incredible. Yeah. You know, I just I just saw a quote. Leonard Bernstein called um, DFD <laughs> the most important singer of the twentieth century. Yeah, he was. He um, uh, he died about three or four years ago or something. He, yeah, well, he had, well he's recognised as that. Yeah, he was mm. just a great interpreter, and um, you know he could sing. He could sing all the composers, but he specialised in Schubert, and he did. Mm. Um, he sung. He sung every one of those six hundred songs and um, recorded them one time or, or another. But yeah, he too was a master. He he kicked ass there, dude. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah, in a, in a colloquial twenty twenty two, you know, phrase. I, I couldn't agree with yep. more. It's incredible. I'm so glad that uh, that uh, now I now I need to do a bit more research and, and hear some more of his material. It's incredible. And you're lifting the tone. I have to say, Shane. So thank you, <laughs> thank you. Oh, that, oh, oh yes, oh, I'm very sophisticated, Jess. Yes, you are. Uh, you brought a bit of class to, yeah. to, to this segment, and it's much appreciated. <laughs> hey, I, I got I got to say, Shane. So, th w what better time than now to talk about your NZO collaboration coming up? What's all this about? What are you doing? Oh, yeah, no, I need to shamelessly plug that. Um, yeah, so what have I got coming? So so is this program, is it being broadcast nationwide or is it being broadcast regionally? No, nationwide. Oh, nationwide, great, so I'll plug my entire New Zealand tour there. Yeah, do, go for it. Um, yeah, yeah, so, okay, well, I'm, here's, here's the shameless um, plug part after bringing the culture. Now we're going to move into the uh, finance um, <laughs> section. Yes. And uh, the, the fiscal territory. And, uh, yeah, so I'm going on tour next month um, through New Zealand with my band, Dimmer, and we're, we're, we're playing an album called I Believe You Are a Star, which is it's the 20th anniversary of that record. It's my favourite recorded record, so we're doing a live recreation of it. So I think um, Christchurch and Wellington are sold out, but tickets still available for Dunedin and Auckland folks. That's that finance section taken care of. I'm turning the page in the financial section to the NZSO things. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing these shows at the NZSO in October in Christchurch and Dunedin. 
um, in successive weekends. And yeah, um, like I say, uh, uh, I, you know, I go see the NZSO when I can, and um, mm. uh, I just went to Sweden and saw them uh, play with Hilary Hahn, who's an amazing violin player, last week. Yeah. And so for my shows with them, um, which are in Dunedin and Christchurch, like I said, uh, they asked me to convene a set and just pick song classical bits of classical music that I found inspiring for my own uh, songwriting and stuff. So that was great, and that I essentially get to DJ the NZSO. It's <laughs> pretty um, incredible. Yeah, that is amazing. Mm. Yeah, mm. No, I, I I appreciate for the for the privilege it is. And then for the second half, we're doing um, I'm doing uh, several of my tunes with um, orchestral arrangements with the orchestra as well. So. Yeah, it'll be a real buzz. And um, I've sung with orchestras before, and um, it's an amazing feeling just to stand in the middle of that sound, you know, because mm. it's, it's an incredible sound. I mean, when you go see an orchestra and this sound rises off these 90 instruments, you know, it's quite immense. Um, yes. So when you're actually standing in the middle of it and performing with that sonic surrounding, yeah, it's um, a really great experience. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So you've just gone through and you've gone, okay, well, I love these classical songs. Uh, let's do these. And then, and then I'll do some of my, you know, my own songs. Wow. Can you tell yeah. us, can you tell us some of those tracks or do you want to keep it secret, keep it a surprise for the audience? Some of the tracks, some of the, the ones that have influenced me. Oh, just, you no, mean? just what you're performing with the NZ, NZSO. Mm. Oh, of my of my songs, of your songs, or yeah, the, of yours. Oh, my songs, mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I'm doing I'm doing stuff um, right through my whole career. I'm doing um, you know some straight jacket fit stuff. I'm doing some dimmer stuff. I'm doing some stuff off my last solo album. Uh, we've done an arrangement of a song called Randolph's Going Home, which is a really early single of mine. Um, so it covers the entire. It's only seven songs, but it covers the entire um, song book, as it were, and. My main mm. thing was that quite often when I've seen concerts where it's rock bands playing with orchestras, it quite often to me, it's quite often an awkward and not entirely convincing marriage, you know. And um, mm. I, uh, I wanted to do this without a rock band, with no drummer and guitar and bass, and bass, but with the orchestra, because with an orchestra, like say, you've got 90 instruments and this incredible sonic palette, you know. Mm. And um, so I talked to this uh, arranger that I was working with and... Um, um, and, uh, you know, agreed that uh, we really wanted to sort of have this integration of my material with, with the orchestra, with it being one, as opposed to these two sort of um, opposing musical factions not quite meeting up in the middle, you know. Mm, so, mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, hopefully the, the proof will be in the thing and um, it'll, be, it'll be a real good show, yeah. A, an harmonious blend. Yes, that's exactly right. What a you're convincing going for. one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. will you be doing I have to ask, are you doing she speeds? Are we doing she speeds? Look, to be honest, I uh, Are you not? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, well I can't actually remember. no, I don't think we are. I think they wanted me to. Yeah. Look, I've always had a um that that song because it's probably my most well known song, you know, I I'm just convinced that when I die, someone's going to sneak up behind my um, <laughs> laid-down body and put Shane She Speeds Carter on the head yeah. side. And I, don't <laughs> want, and I don't want that. No, no. And uh, yeah. if you came an albacross around my neck, and um, because I'm quite a contrary character, I can remember with the Straight Jackets, we actually stopped playing that song for a while. Mm. But I was just reading an interview with Julia Deans on the weekend, and she was talking about going out with Fur Patrol, and she said that, she said in this interview that I read on the weekend that she uh, they stopped playing Lydia, which was their most famous song for quite a while as well. Probably the so, same reason, the same reasons, I guess. So the exact, I, I thought I completely relate to you, sister, for that. Mm. And, um, yeah, I think when you're a songwriter, you kind of think, oh, uh, I don't know, it's pretty childish, but you just think, oh, there's more than that, you know, and um, <laughs> uh, it's, it is probably an entirely childish response to not play it, but... Uh, no, I yeah, think I think so. it's fair. I think if, if people have been in your shoes and they've been, they've been through your career and they've gone, and I guess you're thinking, well, there's other material I've got, and I really want to work work this one up. I just thought it would sound pretty pretty terrific with the NZSO, uh, but you know, well, it, yeah, yeah, it has, yeah, and it you have is, done that yeah, in the past, got, haven't you? Uh, she speeds. You have done that actually. I've done that um, with the uh, yeah. There was um, 
some shows called Tally Ho, which was actually a whole bunch of flying nun music set to, set to orchestras, um, orchestrated by Graham Downs of the Verlaines, and yeah, She Speeds is one of them. Yeah, it has gone, kind of got a orchestral, you know, vibe to it because it's got lots of dynamics and big bits and quiet bits and stuff. So it was well suited for an orchestra. But um, yeah, you know, um, I've written some other, you know, uh, other good ones. Uh, I've, I'll qualify that by saying I've written some real mediocre ones. Winners are hard to find, but um, I've written some other good ones too, and uh, they are in that in the set that I'll be doing with the orchestra in October. Yeah. Okay, case so that that'll be that'll be uh, such a good thing to to look forward to. Also, uh, I didn't know that you had this, um, you know, the Dimmer Show uh, coming up, and uh, yeah, and that's late September, which is which will be great. So hopefully, so Dunedin and Auckland still not sold out for that. Yeah, so we're doing three nights of the Hollywood of the Avondale and uh, in Avondale, and then uh, we're playing the Regent Theatre in Dunedin. But look, we've been trying to play this show, this dimmer show, for a year, mm. and um, had to cancel it, so postpone it so many times. And uh, I, I just want to get it over and done with because we've done so much rehearsing for it, and then it gets postponed, and then we have to get back together six months later, and we've forgotten it all and have to learn it all again. Mm. And um, I just really hope that the crew can all stay well and um, that we can actually get through these shows because, you know, I had some friends uh, from bands. Um, they all went out, you know, a few weeks ago and I don't know, about three different bands went out and they all got sick and had to cancel shows because, yeah. you know, COVID is COVID rampant. And and, flu. Um, I know, it's been the hardest winter and every single musician I speak to has the same, same story, you know. We talked to Barry Saunders from uh, the Waratahs yesterday and he was saying like how keen he is to gig again and, and just how long it's been and how fractured and, you know, honestly, it's been probably the most frustrating time for, for entertainers and, and musicians like yourself and performers and it's required well, a lot of depend, patience, you, you know. Yeah, well, you depend on people to come, you know, to stand in front of people and play to them. And, um, mm. look, you know, I think, the, you know, with COVID, it's such a universal experience. You can't take it personally because it's affected everybody on the planet, which just adds to the weird ambience of the whole experience. But um, at the same time, I know that when we had to cancel our tour for the, on the third time, I thought, OK, well, I am actually allowed to take this personally and feel a bit <laughs> sorry for myself because uh, yeah. yeah. I was over it, you know. And, yeah. Um, you know, look, I'm a musician. I'm a full-time musician. I've played three gigs in the last two years. Is that all? You know? Yeah. Wow. Well, just because, you know, it keeps getting cancelled. Yeah, well, that's um, right. And you're right about the wellness. So like, you, you know, I think everyone's finding that at the moment. It's like, right, I'd like to do this, but it's not a guarantee because they'll probably get sick and then and then they'll have to isolate and then blow. You know, so it has been like that. It's just been like obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. Yeah, well, look, I'm, t yeah, I'm taking out a six-piece band for the dimmer shows, you know, and if one person gets sick, well, we can't, you know, we can't do the show, you know, basically. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, perilous times for standing in front of people, yeah. Mm, it is. Well, let's go to your next song, which is uh, which is a brilliant artist, PJ Harvey, Electric Light. Oh, yeah. I was looking at this video this morning. Isn't it brilliant? I haven't actually seen a video for that. Was there a video for that particular yeah, song? Yeah, a swirling dancer. Oh, it's probably right. like looked like someone from the twenties or thirties, just sort of spinning around under and under a light, and it's it's quite sort of ghostly, and it's yeah, it's really well, it's quite a ghostly spooky. tune. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, yeah, I always thought that was um, sort of one of her um, underrated tracks. I didn't realise it even got a video made for it. But mm. yeah, look, um, I've always. Um, Full respect for PJ Harvey, you know, she's real exploratory as an artist, you know, she's always trying different angles on what she does. And uh, I can remember seeing a show that she played at the Civic Theatre up here, and she just did the solo show. And, you know, the Civic Theatre is a big theatre, and um, but her talent and her radiance just filled up that huge space. She was awesome. Mm. And um, she did this tune, uh, The Electric Light, and it was great. And, um, yeah... Can I just say at this point, too, that um, the whole thing of having to choose a top five is actually an impossible task. And uh, I think I said to you in an email to you that, you know, I could give you 500 songs that I love, but five is kind of impossible. But at the same time, you know, all these tunes I do really 
I've got a lot of time for all these tunes, so yeah, mm. including the Speed J Harvey one, yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, I talked to Dave Gent from The Exponents, and he said um, it was just cruel doing five. Peter Ehrlich was the same. You know, everyone has said, um, are you kidding me? You can't. This is the impossible. Thing, yeah. And and it just yeah. and it took them days. And then um, Dave was hilarious because he said, "Look, um, I've chosen this, but now I know that uh, I know that when you're um, when you play them, I'll have another change of heart, and I'll think, oh well, actually, I wished I put that one in. You know, so oh, of course, so difficult. I don't know, but it's kind of, it's, it's it's very hard to define. But it's the same when people ask you, um, oh, you play music. What do you say when people say, oh, so what kind of music do you play? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I just got. What just, do you say? What What do I say if if um? Oh, you're asking me. Yeah. Uh, if I play music, um, you mean what do yeah. I? Who do I listen to? No, what I'm saying is when someone asks you, oh, what kind of music do you play? What do you say? Oh, on the show, I say everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no. Don't you personally play music? Don't you? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I try. I mean, you know, I'm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been writing some songs and I'm hoping to go and record some next week, which is really amazing. Will be a bucket list wish for me, for sure, if I can get time oh, off work. Oh, great. But I'm just hoping... Uh, serious. Uh, yeah, serious. So that will be lovely. And that's with a Dunedin, uh, well, a, a band that originated from Dunedin. So if that comes... I mean, I still can't believe it's happening, but it is happening apparently. And So, um, so when are, you, are yeah. you recording it next week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the plan. Great. Yeah. And, um, and so and the music... Are they, well, are they tunes that you wrote? Well, it's funny no, because... So I'm, sorry, I'm interviewing you now. No, they're, so they're, are they tunes that you wrote? <laughs> they are tunes. We need to play this song. They are tunes. It's funny because PJ Harvey is one of the um, favourites of these guys uh, that I'm working with at the moment. They love... We, we, it's, it's sort of like... Yeah, how would I describe it? Alternative, um, a bit, oh, God, what's it like? Aldous Harding, maybe, um, oh, what yeah. else? Like, um... Oh, oh, like Aldous Harding, she's great. Even like, yeah, or like, um, like the old, um, but I'm inspired a bit by, um, you know, the Velvet Underground and that sort of, I don't know, stuff like that, like sort of very... Probably quite somber, I guess, but um, right. But a bit dark and a bit, you know. So if it look, if it works out, Shane, I'll <laughs> I'll, give, oh, I'll, look, I'll let you know. Um, but that you'll, yeah, you'll be too I'd, busy with your stuff. But um, you know, like it's no, been a, I'd, 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 I'd know, love to, I'd love but, to hear it. But yeah, it's been re so. The music is like this is kind of different. There's only kind of maybe one or two, and and that one's a bit punk, like Patty Smith, because I love her too. So yeah, if, right. Like if I had a top five, mine would be probably a bit more bogan than yours. So I'd have, you know, I'd have um. Probably Patty Smith and Lou Reed and I don't know um, Iggy Pop and you know I, I like um, I like quite like Punky right. and, and Chrissy Hine Pretenders that sort of stuff. So I like that's those oh, those. Chrissy Hine's cool. Yeah, she's I love her to pieces. I think she's incredible. Yeah, she, she's you know? sexy. Yeah, she's yeah. she's amazing and she's she wrote some damn good tunes too. Yeah, did she what? And she still is. So so like that's my kind of um, that's what that's what uh, that's what I love. So, but it's funny because did you see her when yeah. she played in Dunedin at the Dunedin Stadium? Uh, yes, I did. With um, it was a double eight, though, wasn't it? Was it with Deborah Harry? Right, I didn't see or it. Was Stevie. she good? It was with Stevie. She was incredible. She was so she was better than the main. Yeah, she was. She was. She was incredible. She just she rocked. She just walked out. She had yeah. a guitar. She 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 totally uh, controlled it. Dominated. She, yeah, dominated. She was she was just as she is. I had to interview her once. I found her the most intimidating interviewee ever, but she was she was really cool and she was heavily into that uh a sort of uh, vegetarian, vegan kind of thing, and talking about not wearing, yeah, not right, wearing leather yeah. jackets, and, and then not eating McDonald's. Yeah. And no, she was she was funny and uh, and tough and and strong, and sh and and she is. If you if you um, check out a song of hers called Alone, it's really good. She talks about how she loves being on her own and how she walks to the graveyard of her former bandmate. And she sits there and has, oh, yeah. has a fag and reads his epitaph. And it's something like, you know, don't you laugh for, you know, one day you will be like me. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's really, really cool. You know, she's like, I like, yeah. I like being alone. You know, she's just awesome. But, yeah, so yeah. That, that's kind of what excites me. But I do, um, I, I, I like PJ. I'm just not, I just didn't um, get on the PJ wave originally so really interested to play. let's play this now because we've got so much more to play so um unless right. unless we go for another three hours yeah i really like how it just sort of just drifts off back into the night you know it doesn't really nothing really happens and just mm. kind of sits there and um but i was thinking tonally it's actually quite similar to that schubert song and that it's just really empty and you know the, mm. the dfd tune is just a keyboard and a voice and similarly that's just her playing with a little bass synth and mm. um mm. so so tonally it's not actually a million miles removed you know, 
Um, yeah, no, great. Love that tune. It's awesome. Powerful, hey. Mm. Yeah, really powerful. You know, we're going to um, we're going to talk about another band now, uh, which with the interesting name. Oh, actually, someone has just asked who I'm talking to, so I need to remind listeners. <laughs> someone just text saying, "Who are you talking to?" So, everyone, if you've just tuned in, this is Shane Carter on uh, on Stuart Island Discs. We should give it its correct title. And Shane Carter, of course, we all know from Straight Jacket Fits, but from so many other things like Dimmer. And uh, now, I was surprised to hear that you moved to Auckland, though, from Dunedin. Is it working out well? Um, look, you know, because I'm from Dunedin. I actually spent years living in Auckland, and then I was really over Auckland, and um, I, I was walking down Ponsonby Road one day, and I thought, what am I doing in Auckland? And uh, so I went back home, which was Dunedin, and I was down there for about five years, and... But then when the pandemic struck, I thought, oh, I, um, I'd spent quite a bit of time in Asia, and I really loved how warm it was there. And I thought, well, if I can't go to Asia, I need to go somewhere warmer in New Zealand. So I came back up to Auckland because at least it was warm. I hear and that. And if I look at those <laughs> catastrophically low temperatures down there, I think it's a damn wise decision at the moment. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> do you know, I don't, th- I don't think I can live here anymore after this winter. Like, it was minus nine yesterday, Shane, and we had um, our blinking uh, water pipes froze so couldn't brush my teeth and all that kind of carry on or have a shower and I was hard like core. and I was going you know this is getting a bit hard and I'm, I'm getting a bit too, I, too mature for this do you know right yeah, yeah look, it's just it's just this um, day look because you're in Queenstown right yes yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's cold up there mate it's been Bloody brutal hell. it's been and brutal yeah, yeah yeah well look I just couldn't actually you know and like I said I grew up in Dunedin so when I went back there for five years I thought okay this probably isn't going to change I, you know it's probably going to be like this most winters. One thing I was impressed with, though, was uh, enduring winters down there again, was um, how tough South Islanders are. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, they are. I, 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 did, I did some mentoring. I did some music mentoring. I can remember down at South Otago High School, and I can remember going down there one day, and it was freezing, and there's frost on the ground, and then all these tough Belclutha kids walking around in jandals and singlets, basically, and I thought, oh, man, they yeah. breed them tough in the South Island. Yeah, the producer today but, uh, is wearing shorts and a, and a T-shirt and a bare feet, you know, it's like he's in Fiji, and I've I've actually got a mate. I have a lot of friends actually who do the cold water swimming right through winter, Shane. So they're like come um, jumping in the lake, you know, on on these evenings where we're only getting to like five oh, that, degrees. That's that a show off. It's amazing, eh? Uh, incredible. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it keeps you. On- I guess it keeps you honest. And the thing is that um, when you do live in Auckland and in the warmer climes, it totally wusses you out as well. You know, you go back down, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm so cold. Ooh, and, uh, I can't keep warm. Oh, put on a jersey, you know. <laughs> Come on, you, there's still a bit of that Dunedin boy in there, surely. You know that tough uh, southern uh, upbringing stood you in good stead. Um, oh no, I'm proudly. Um, Proudly South Island, totally. Yeah, I find it very insulting if I'm ever referred to as an Aucklander. I always go, <laughs> no, I'm not like a six-year-old. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah, don't say no, that. No, exactly yeah. in that tone of voice, yeah. yeah no, I'm You're not. a spirit. <laughs> yes. Spirit. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we used to say at our school. That must be a real Kiwi thing from our age group, Shane. Yeah, because I'll oh, spear, spear yourself. Spear yourself. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, spear yourself, yeah. spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, air whore. We used to use air whore a lot at our school, you know, which is which is friend. Sure. But we'd say it, we'd say it in such a rude way. It's like you know, you get lost, air whore. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, let's, exactly. Let's get on to the next act, which is called Sleaford Mods. I don't. I'm. You're going to have to school me up because I'm I'm new to these guys. What's the story with that? Right, so Sleaford Mods are this duo, they're these two geezers, there's no other word. Yeah. Uh, these guys who belatedly found fame, they're in their 50s or something, and um, they've, become, they've become famous over the last 10 years. They're, um, it's just one guy who does this ranting, and um, another guy who plays all the backing tracks on a... Um, on a Mac, on a on a, a Mac Pro book, and he stands there with his hands in his pocket um, while pushing play on his Mac Pro book, and this other guy just does his ranting. But um, uh, yeah, I really love the Sleaford mods; they're incredibly entertaining. I think I've given chosen the song with the least amount of swearing in it. Um, uh, quite punk rock. Yeah. But when I heard them, I, I did their entire back catalogue, which is eight albums, and. Um, um, they're all good, and my main feeling when I finished it was I thought, oh, thank God someone is saying this stuff, especially in this age of um, digitised, cleaned-up music, you know, like, uh, uh. Uh, they, they're kicking ass, and what they're saying uh, with their social critiquing, and um, 
they're just calling out a lot of people, which being a punk rock kid myself, yeah. um, I already like because there's a lot to be called out, you know. And um, well, that that yeah, was so, that was so, you as a kid, wasn't it? I mean, that was your whole uh, modus operandi when when you first, uh, you know, took to the stage. That you you were total punk. Yes, I was, and um, I would like to think that um, despite my um, you know slow slide into showbiz, middle of the road mediocrity, that I've actually um, held on to some of those um, <laughs> qualities because I think. Um, you know, I do actually feel like, uh, even though most of mainstream New Zealand wouldn't have a clue who I am, I do have a bit of a platform, and um, and also because I'm a musician, I'm not a politician, I'm not a media personality, I don't have to sell myself to people in any shape or form, so I actually feel this tremendous liberation that I can pretty much say whatever I want, mm. and uh, within reason, and... Um, so I think it's good to use the platform to offer a contrary voice to what you're feared by the mainstream because the mainstream propaganda is pretty damn strong and you really need the voices swimming in the opposite direction. Yeah. So, um, so you know you need the you need you need the contrary the, the contrary opinion and um, mm-hmm. fleeted mods certainly offer that in heaps. Um, right. You know, uh, the, the song we're going to hear from them is called Tweet Tweet Tweet, which is just about the the beauty of tweeting. But, you know, for an example, they uh, their song about the Queen is um, about royalty. It's just called The Corgi, and it's just got this line, um, The Corgi, he's always warm at night, you know. <laughs> that says so much. That's Doesn't an awesome it? social comment. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Go in and get yourself a Corgi. <laughs> okay. No, then... just, you know, The Corgi. No, the well... Queen's Corgis are always warm at night. And it's yeah. like, well, yeah, that's well... a lot better than, uh, than it is for a lot of other people in, in Her Majesty's realm, yeah. <laughs> Dead right. Here's Tweet, Tweet, Tweet. Uh, yes, the microphone is on. And uh, that was Tweet, Tweet, Tweet. Sleaford Mods. The choice of Shane Carter. Good choice. Can you hear me, Shane? Hello, Shane. Sorry about that. Are you there? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. am here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that was a seamless uh, outro of that song by me here. Very good. Uh, no, um, yeah. lo- love that. Love that. Oh, underneath, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they were. Mods, they rule. They do. I, I see why you like them. Uh, yeah, very, very good indeed. So we're um, we're actually. You know, it's funny because one of the songs you gave me today is by none other than Brian Eno, and it's fifteen minutes fifty-seven seconds long. Uh, so obviously. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, like I was like to say, I found out it was an, that the show was an hour, and I thought, how do I do this? And uh, <laughs> I thought, yeah, here you, we go. You just thought, well, there, we'll there. I'll pick the longest song that was ever recorded, and then we won't have to say a word, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, uh, there is actually a 16-minute version, the edit version, which is the one that I'm familiar with. But yeah, um, yeah. I don't even know if I've heard the 57-minute version. But um, No, f- 15, yeah, bro- 15, 57, so nearly 16 minutes. Oh, you, I, thought, you oh I, mean? I thought you said 57 yeah, yeah. minutes. No, no, yeah, no. no. I think yeah. the original, yeah, I think that's an edit, and that the original was 57 minutes or oh, something. Oh, you're but, joking. Um, it wouldn't yeah, surprise yeah. me from Brian Eno. Yeah. Do you know what his birth yeah. name was? Brian Peter no. George Brian Peter George St John Le Baptiste de La Salle Eno RD one. Yeah. What does that mean? What's RD one? La da, is that right? I know. Is, 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 is that his actual name? Apparently, according to Wiki, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So almost as long as one of his ambient pieces. Uh, well, <laughs> so of course his music had to be long. That's right. So the song that you've chosen is is a Ikibukuro. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Something like that. And so, why did you yeah. choose this track? Well, you know, so Brian, you know, he's done lots of pop stuff and he's done lots of rock stuff. And, you know, he did some, um, after he left Roxy Music back in the 70s, he did uh, some amazing um, pop rock albums, sort of art rock albums, like um, um, Here Come the Warm Jets, Taking Tiger Mountain by Surprise, Another Green World, Mm. uh, which are great song-based records. But at the same time, he really got into doing ambient experiments with um, music that just sat there and... um, um, I uh, went through a phase where I got really obsessed with those bits of his ambient works. Mm. Um, what I liked about them was that there was no songwriterly rules to them. They were just basically these vague wisps of music that just pretty much sat there and slowly mutated. And mm. on one level, that you know, a lot of ambient music is this kind of flotation tank whale noise or oh, relax, you know, kind of stuff. Mm. Um, whereas his stuff. It's got this sort of beauty to it, but at the same time, it's kind of got this tension and anxiety to it too, underlying the beauty. Mm. And um, so I love this thing that 
this thing that just sort of sits there and slowly mutates. And um, I also love a lot of art and um, um, films and music that isn't afraid to set its own pace, you know, mm. and um, that you have to approach on its own terms. And um, the pace may be slower than you, what you're used to, but you eventually, you'll, it's like your bodily rhythm adjusts to it and, you know, you fall, you slip into the pace of what's being presented to you. Mm. And so Brian, Amb- Brian Eno's ambience works are exactly like that. So Definitely does that. Um, Something you need time yeah. time and space to, to really appreciate. So so we're coming, so what we need to do, obviously we can't, we can't take the whole song, 